need to know. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Adoptees podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Corey, Corey Skornick. Looking forward to our conversation, Corey. Really, you're, you're such a lovely lady. As am I. I'm looking forward to talking with you this morning. Yeah. So this word healing, does it, to what extent does it resonate with you, Corey? You know, I would say less and less. Oh. As as time goes on. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't know if that's uh, idiosyncratic or if it's um, just wisdom with age or experience. Um, but sometimes as a therapist and as a teacher, I think healing, the word can be used so pejoratively it means it implies sickness, it implies damage. And I, there's something about that now. I mean, I used to take that as a matter of course. If you're coming in to th see a therapist, there's something wrong, you need healing. Um, and I think as I get older, maybe more experienced, I choose my words more carefully and I try to think of a therapeutic encounter. I like to use the word growth and change as opposed to healing. And, and it, it's, I think of it almost as a subliminal shift that um, if, you, if you take on the, uh, the role of patient, or you take on the role, of, and I think to, to a large extent, that is why the therapeutic community made a shift a while back, quite a while back, to seeing patients as clients. And some of that was a function of uh, the medical profession kind of being ousted from therapeutic, psychologically therapeutic endeavors, and it moving into family therapy, domain and social work domain. So patients were not always uh, seeking medical care or, or even psychiatric care. They were sometimes just seeking some kind of help for a problem. And because I was a family therapist and my training was mostly in family systems theory, we started to use the word client. And you only use the word patient for somebody who had good medical insurance. <laughs> Ah, so you would make that shift automatically if you were talking about a patient. It was somebody you knew had you were going to file insurance claims on them. Yeah, and and clients were people who were coming in to get uh you know to get some wisdom from you for for problems in their family or problems with their relationships, and so it's kind of a you know uh it's a subtle shift, and it probably is in part, a uh, little bit of bullshit, but I think it's, it, I don't know. I don't know. I, <laughs> I'm on the fence. I'm in, I'm in a transition period myself with, with all this. And I think it, some of it is because I'm retired now. I'm not seeing patients. I'm not seeing clients in a practice. Um, but I still have a lot of friends that are, and we still talk about the issues and I still read a lot and, and talk to authors that, you know, a lot of people who are writing books about adoption, especially, will ask me to review their books. And so I do a bit of that. And in that world, I think healing still dominates. The idea of healing still dominates. Yeah. I would uh, agree. I would agree with you. M most people still most people that I speak to, when I ask them that question, to what extent does healing um, uh, resonate with you, they will say, yes, it does. It, it resonates with me. That would be the majority. Um, and, uh, and But every now and again, somebody says, uh, it, it doesn't. And that's great, right? Because it's broad for me, it's broadening out the it's broadening out the conversation uh it's broadening out the focus it's bro it's broadening out the the metaphor right healing is a metaphor that goes with the wound metaphor right and, 
and we've we've gone. Um, Nancy Vera didn't write the book until the early nineties, or publish the book until the early nineties. Until then, nothing. She 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 caught people's imagination with this ominous titled, ominously titled book that scares the SH1T out of people, I think. <laughs> um, so, yeah, healing healing is a, a, a metaphor. But you, uh, if, So you, you prefer growth. What, what does growth mean for you then? Um, well, this is the BS part. It's, it's probably the same as healing. Um, but it has a slightly more, I think, a slightly more hopeful tone to it and uh so so if you if you consult a professional because something you perceive something is wrong let's let's use the car you take your car in i don't know what's wrong but i'm pretty sure something's wrong it makes a noise you know it's not running like all the other cars are running so uh, can you look at it? You have some expertise with cars. Can you, can you drive my car around? Look at my car. Tell me what's wrong with my car. So nobody comes into therapy because everything's peachy. So there's a given that, that somebody's complaining about something. In, in a family therapy practice, uh, I would say more than 50% of the time, somebody's complaining about somebody else. Something's wrong with my family. It's my parents. If it's an adolescent, something's wrong with my mom. You know, they're, they're, you know, I'm fine. I'm fine, but something's wrong. Can you fix this? So in a therapeutic encounter with a family, uh, I think it's a good idea to, to think of the growth model as opposed to the healing model because if if you have a if you're approaching a family from a healing model that means somebody's sick and that implies that there's something wrong with a certain person and i i guess you can you could say okay the system is sick and and usually it is it's a systemic problem right everybody's rigid in their functions and their roles and growth means everybody takes a look at the whole system and everybody can grow out of the rigid patterns and the ruts that they're in to perform kind of stereotypic roles in a family. And if they grow out of those roles, that can, even one person in a system can make profound change if they grow. Uh, ask any adoptee who has quote unquote come out of the fog. When they come out of the fog, there are profound changes in their circle, their intimate circle. So, so when because I've I've been using the term coming out of the fog, I think in the same sense as you, um, as in uh, we become aware of the impact of adoption on us. So you're nodding, yeah? That's because other people say come that's, out. That's a piece of it though. That's a piece of it. Okay. Yeah. So what's the what's the other pieces? Because that's kind of an intellectual piece. You know, you're you're aware. You have awareness. Yeah. Oh, gee, that that probably impacted me pretty pretty severely. Oh gee, I never, I never thought of that. I never addressed that. Oh, now I see. But that's an intellectual piece. There, the other piece, which is emotional, is I hurt from this, and I have been hurt by this, and I have chosen in response to how I feel. I have chosen things. I have chosen behaviors because of that. And when you come out of the fog, that means you grow into different behaviors. Different choices. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, and all three things to make profound change in a life, to heal, if you want to call it healing, to grow, um, to get better, any, any, any verbiage you want to use for that, I think requires addressing all three functions, all three human functions. You have to change intellectually. You have to know better and you have to feel better or you will feel better when you change what you do. When what you do is better, more productive, um, more healthy for yourself and for the whole system. Yeah. What, what about the identity bit part? The um, identity. So yeah. you, you, you've, you've talked about um, thoughts, you've talked about feelings, mm -hmm. and you've talked about behaviour. Mm -hmm. What about thought? Uh, sorry, what about identity? Well... I think all identity is the um, the centrifugal piece of that, right? So your identity what, is formed by your thoughts, your feelings, and your behaviors. Centrifugal. Sorry, what's that? Yeah, the, the it's the center. It's your 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 core is your identity, and from your identity, your everything else emanates. How you think, how you feel, how you behave are those functions are flung out from the core of your identity. So if, if you stop calling yourself damaged and I'll, I'll tell you, this is a, just a little aside. The, the, there are two people in, in my historical, you know, my, the practice, my, the history of my private practice that taught me a lot about this and how identity and how you talk about yourself uh, impacts everything, impacts your whole life. And both of those people had profound disabilities. And um, neither one, when, when, they, when I first started seeing them as, as uh, therapy, and they were both students, so they had gone, they were in college already. And to, just to get to college, can you imagine you have, you have a profound physical disability you cannot walk. You're in a wheelchair. I can't even imagine the difficulty. I couldn't find parking sometimes and went home. I can't imagine what it would be like to, to be able to, every movement you make is um, confounded by, let's say, cerebral palsy or you know some other kind of paralysis. And, these, and yet these people persist and they both in both cases achieved graduate degrees when I went on in school. Uh, one of them drove a car. Wow. Uh, they did th things that, you know, are difficult for able-bodied, uh, you know, completely quote unquote normal. And, and so what I, what I saw in them, what I learned from them was they did not see themselves as disabled or unable and they didn't talk about themselves that way and they really hated the you know there was a disability center on campus to assist them and they hated that they hated the idea that everything about them to the to the outside world to the so-called normal world um was was uh colored by that word by being disabled or unable and or challenged in that way and they didn't they didn't see themselves that way and they didn't want other people to refer to them that way and i think partially because of that because at at the same time i was doing this i was doing a, a little bit of work with veterans and they're in that world cleaves into veterans who speak about themselves as a damaged and you know disabled veterans damaged and um, traumatized and um, what what's the other word? Um, oh, I can't think of it now, but if you think of yourself that way and that's your language about yourself and that becomes your identity, you automatically 
do less. You feel less capable. You don't do things that are hard. You kind of, you know, you give up to that identity, you surrender to that identity. And in both of those instances, working with people who had challenges, real significant challenges, and in the, the um, veterans world, what I saw was how important it was to use language that was comfortable for the for the patient or the client to see themselves. You, I, so I would not use the word, word disabled ever with these people because they responded to it. Mm-hmm. And, and it taught, it told them that I was not honoring the identity that they wanted. And it was, it, and that's a profound thing between a, a, a client and a therapist. You have to see who they want you to see, who they believe they are. Because if you don't, as a therapist, then who who's going to? This is a this is one of the most profound experiences of their life in terms of interpersonal relations. They come in, they give this total stranger a lot of information about themselves. And if all that information is clouded in language of disability and trauma and hurt and illness, it will change how much they can change and how much they can grow. And if you're not going to therapy to change and grow, what well, are you just going in so you can so you have a witness to your whining? What what's that about? Yeah. And I don't think I, there's a lot of therapists out there that are are less active, you know, less, I I always assumed if somebody came to me and gave me money at the end of an hour, (laughs) they wanted results. They wanted to change. They wanted to grow. And they didn't want to just sit and whine and have me listen to them. They didn't want a friend. They weren't buying a friend. So I was kind of a hard taskmaster when, when people consulted me. And it, it isn't a good match with everybody. Some people do want to kind of just want to whine, <laughs> but that yeah. I'm not the therapist for them. <laughs> so what what did you see amongst us uh, adoptees then in terms ah. of identity stuff? I, I, you know, that's, that's a very complicated question because you and I talked a little bit before about um, how important I think it is for a therapist to really listen and not just to adoptees, but we're talking about adoptees now. So when I, when I, when I started out in practice, I think I confessed to you how ignorant I was. And I think in those early days, the eighties, everybody was ignorant about adoption. It was taboo. You didn't talk about it. And I don't remember if I told you about the family I was seeing, and I was seeing them for months. And wherever you are, I apologize. But months went on with this family. They had a troubled teenage boy, misbehaving, you know, acting out the usual, kind of kind of a normal uh, consult. Yeah. Months I saw this family before anyone said the word adoption. And finally, they told me he was adopted. And Simon, it was like somebody hit me with a two by four, because even though I was still ignorant, I really didn't know anything. You know, I really was dumb. I wasn't informed. I hadn't read. There weren't any books. Like you said, Nancy Verio's book didn't come out. Her first book didn't come out until the 90s. So there wasn't much literature on it. There was no training, no professional training in adoption at that time. And when when they said this in session, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You've been coming in here week after week and nobody told me he was adopted. Don't you think that's meaningful? That's something I should know, you know? And they didn't. They they honestly did not think... I, I don't think it was that they didn't think it was important. I think it was to be hidden. It was something they they were hiding it for his benefit and they were hiding it for their own benefit. And, and you know, as an adoptee, you know that oftentimes in adoption, there's shame. People are ashamed they're adopted. 
parents are ashamed they couldn't have their own children and they had to adopt, you know, there's, it's tainted. It's, it's, uh, it's colored by, uh, by all of that. So uh, to, to get to drill down into your question with, with adoptees, the language has to be the adoptees language. We have to blend with them. We have to join with them. And, and maybe what is necessary for them in therapy is to, is to spend a little bit of time uh, sitting with what it feels like to suddenly confront the feelings that you, you said you called, you called coming out of the fog. And especially because that's, that's when people generally think about going into therapy. They're out of the fog. What's the next step? Oh, I, I, I'm messed up. I need help. So they go see a professional therapist. And back in the 80s and 90s, I think they didn't get much help. And, uh, and what I think was probably didn't hurt anybody because even back then I knew to listen to the, listen to the person, listen to the individual, hear, really hear what they're saying and really let them know that I get it. I understand. I, I hear there's pain there. I hear there's, there's confusion, there's frustration, and there's um, stuff that could get, go better in their life. And a lot of times it's around substance abuse. That's what brings them in the door. Um, but that is, you know, the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. So, um, so I think, I think, you know, the short answer would be um, to, to listen to each individual person, because as you know, being an adoptee yourself, your story is very different from the next adoptee's story. And yeah, there's some universal notions, but nobody can tell you how to feel about your being adopted. And nobody should tell you how to feel about it. Least of all your therapist. And at the heart of so many of these um people's lives is, is a, uh, a a wounded narrative you know i i talk to i think i do i think i shared this with you um i i didn't believe that i was primarily wounded until i read the primal wound right now that makes me different but we're all different right um I, I I see for me with the primal wound, I I saw it first as a diagnosis, which was a relief, right? And then I thought this is a this is a prison cell. Yeah, I'm I'm stuck with this, I, and l luckily, I, I wasn't hanging around um, with people. Uh, yeah. Hope, hope, well, luckily, I was hanging around with people that were more open, open to change and maybe open to growth, to use your words. And and, and then I, I, did, I realized that this wasn't a this. I realized that this wasn't a life sentence. The uh, and that came to me in a in an in an insight. So one moment I was sunk, the next minute I was floating again. Yeah, because, I mean, I guess you, you changed your language and your language. No, I didn't change my language. This is the thing, right? I You're didn't still... change my language. My language changed for me through an insight. Right. So... I, we, we've all we're, we're brought up in the Western world to think that we change stuff. No, change changes stuff. It, it's when we have an insight. I, I don't make the insights. I don't make the insights happen. I'm, I'm not. You know, I tried that um, affirmation bullshit. You know, looking in the mirror. Right, nothing worked. I don't. I. I. It, it, it's. Like, 
an, an old mentor of mine says, yeah, listen like a rock with ears and, and, and listen for an insight and don't beat yourself up when you don't have an insight. Don't, don't get, a, don't get jealous about somebody. Don't get um, epiphany envy, right? Don't, don't get, you're in a, you're in a group situation, right? And, and somebody has just had this aha Charlton Heston moment. This changes, this changes everything, right? But, and then you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, why can't I have the insight that, that he had? Or why can't I have the insight that she had? I don't make, I didn't change my language. My language changed on the back of an insight that I had, which is why I interview people around their insights. I try and interview people around the insights that they've had. You had an insight where you went from, okay, I, uh, I, I used to, I used to think this, this um, healing metaphor was uh, was a good one, um, and then you went to you you had an, an insight and you realised that no, I don't I don't like I don't like that healing word as much as I do. I don't want to um, what what's the word? I, I don't want I don't want to pathologize adoptees. I don't want to say that they're wounded. I don't want to say that there's something wrong with them. I don't want to think that way because what you saw with those two clients with the um, who bucked the system, who got so cheesed off about being, uh, about, you know, you, even the term disability. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't make change happen. Change has happened to me when I have a an insight. That's kind of the way I see it. Well, just... let me let me go back a, a a little bit for you. Please do. Do you think that there's a gender difference in in how adoptees are permitted to experience? Uh, uh, adoption as impactful. I, I don't know. I've, I've never, I've never considered that question. I don't think I. Mm. I, I, I do. I do know that. I do that. Know that eighty percent of the listeners to the show are women. Okay, so I would say statistically that indicates that there's a there's a gender difference. <laughs> it, it, it would, but yeah, whether it's exactly how you set out the question yeah. i'm not sure so no our methodology sucks but <laughs> <laughs> but um i i think in uh social science social social psychology research there's there are gender differences in 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 almost everything especially in western culture um we really uh we we are you can see what's going on now we are really uncomfortable with the idea of femininity and masculinity being on a continuum we're really uncomfortable with that we like the binary western culture likes male and female and nothing nothing cloudy in between that's that's how we are and if you're male a lot of times western culture prescribes masculinity as um, I, I always used to say in lecture, we allow men to feel two things. Men, men can feel in public. You can feel angry and you can feel horny. And that's it. Try to feel something else and somebody's going to call you a sissy. Whereas women, we get all the feelings, <laughs> but we're punished if we feel if we're if our sexuality is revealed if you were if we get pregnant as a teenage girl we're punished severely and we're not allowed to feel angry if we're angry we're a bitch so we have you know our culture and our societies cleave the emotional experience in two depending on your identified gender and I think that is very often 
for male adoptees, they experience a prohibition about even addressing the topic of adoption. They can't, they can't say, you know, you, you know, they, they might be able to say the reality is, yeah, I was adopted when I was a baby, but they can't say I was a, an adoptee and I always felt I always felt a little odd. I always felt like I didn't belong. I always felt like my siblings were, they were different than I was. I was different. And yeah, somebody is going to say, everybody feels that way. That's not a, that's not a function of adoption. You hear that all the time, but, and, and okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody feels weird and different sometimes, you know, but adoptees feel something completely different in their weirdness. And I, I believe that. I believe when they say, I always felt different. It's, and oh, I, I, this is a great story. I love this story. I've, I've heard from adoptees a million times this thing about um, the first time you look at the face of somebody that you're um, uh, related to by blood. You know, it, is it genetic mirroring? Is yes. that the experience? That's okay. The yeah. And, and I've, I've heard that for years and years, you know, how powerful that experience is. Um, I have a good friend who's adopted and she said the first time she saw her sister, her blood, her, her full-blooded sister, um, she said it was amazing. They just sat with each other for hours and moved their hands around and blinked at each other. And, you know, because it was for her, it was, and her sister had a similar experience because she had always known about this lost sister. That's a whole other kind of, you know, experience. But um, if, if you haven't had it, if you don't know it, you really don't get it entirely. But a couple summers ago, my cousin's daughter brought her triplets out to um, California to visit. And we went to a restaurant with these little kids. And I'm, I'm thinking they were about six, six years old. And the little girl was just looking at me, like just like staring at me, staring at me. And I couldn't, I couldn't understand, you know, okay. Uh, you know, I don't know what's going on here, but, and then her mom came over and her mom said, Elle, what do you see? What are you looking at? And she said, Corey has blue eyes. And her mom said, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Corey's your cousin. And her eyes lit up and she she just, she had this molecular shift. It was amazing to, to see. And her mom said, "She, you're the first person that she knows she's related to who has her eye color. Every other person in her family and her extended family had brown she happened she happened to have been artificially inseminated with a sperm donor so but everybody had brown eyes she was the only one who had blue eyes so obviously the sperm donor had blue eyes or somebody in his line had blue eyes right but she had gone through her 6 years of life <laughs> very short life experiencing something that made her alien to herself because, because she, and she, her mom said, yes, yeah, she noticed and stuff like that. But it, this moment of genetic mirroring w with sh she and I, I felt, I'm sure a tiny fraction of what it's like for the adoptee to feel, but it was so powerful. I mean, it shook me. This little kid just rocked me a little bit. I thought, oh, that's, that's what the adoptees are talking about. Holy cow, that's something. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's amazing. It's powerful. Did you feel that? Uh, well, when I got a photo of my birth mum, I, I didn't, I showed it, I looked at it and it didn't, it didn't do anything. It didn't resonate with me. She didn't. Um, but then my wife said, no, that you, you can tell that. Uh, and, and when I look at it now, um, I can see that we've got the same nose. But I've, I've had that photo for I don't know eight, ten years now. Uh, for a long time, I didn't, I didn't see, uh, I didn't, I didn't feel that, I didn't feel that genetic mirroring. Um, uh, but to an extent, I do. 
Yeah. I, I think it's different if you're with a live person. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've heard uh, a, a therapist who's an adoptee, uh, a guy called Elliot Driscoll's been on the show. He he was blown away by it. You know, we did a we did an episode basically, and that was that was a core part of it. Was the genetic it was gen, genetic on genetic mirroring. I'll I'll put a link in the show notes, um, listeners, and then you can you can check it out with uh, Elliot. And I'm I'm quite proud of myself because four four hundred and eighty interviews in the fact that i can remember that was elliot and for the genetic <laughs> mirroring because most of the time when i when i'm thinking about that i can't i can't remember the name of the person um can i bring you back to this identity thing yeah um so what's it all about what's the whole like that that I the identity what, what's what's the thing what's the thing what it's all about that the you know the, is it this wounded identity is it is it looking is is that is that one of the lessons one of the insights that we're talking about here if you if you think you're wounded then you're gonna yeah if you think you're wounded in your essence if we if we think that we are wounded at our core then um, if we believe that, uh, if we, if we uh, Jude, who's been on the show and did a guest co-host, she talks about the trauma-bound identity, right? So mm -hmm. if our identity is trauma-bound, then surely that's going to get in the way of our healing, right? Yes. Yeah, it is. I, I, I would say the short answer is yes. That will get in the way. That's again in the way. So... What are we doing? What are we doing here? We're 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 surfacing. We're, we're surfacing. We're bringing beliefs to the surface. We're bringing insights to the surface uh, to say, "This is what Simon learned. This is what Corey learned. This is what Jude learned." Does that does that resonate with you, listeners? Does that spark an insight for you? Is that a catalyst? Is there something there? that you can like um that you've that's going to give you some wiggle room you know so like you know when kids if if we think if we think a tooth right using a metaphor for i don't know how i came up with this right but if we think a a belief right or or a or a, a way of seeing ourselves right if we say that that's a tooth right it's a a a baby tooth so we 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 wiggle the, the the tooth at some point becomes loose. It starts to wiggle in its little holder in the gum, and then you you can put your finger on it and you can kind of wiggle it around, and then it pops out, right? And and then you hopefully you get well. In my day, it was five p. You know, you get five, you get you get five p, or you get ten p, or you get twenty p because the tooth area is being right. So yeah. you, you, you that that's the reward for the tooth that for the tooth going um what we're doing here we're we're wiggling around with a belief so I, i'm saying this all the time at the moment and sorry listeners but it's a big one right gabo amate says the feeling of not being enough is not a feeling it's a belief right so if it's a belief can we hold that belief up to the light and 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 see it see the belief differently see through the belief sorry see through the belief can we create a bit of space amongst ourselves sorry a, a bit of space between us and the uh, and and the belief can we get a, can we distance ourselves a little bit from our tra trauma bound identity can we wiggle the tooth with the belief to see if it's if that if that belief is firmly rooted and sooner or later the belief goes when we say it's not true um what's what what what's what's the difference that makes the difference in these perspective changes in these belief busting moments 
Well, I think what he's saying is, I, I wouldn't say it's untrue. I wouldn't say it's inaccurate. I, I like it. I'm attracted to it. But I would also say it only goes so far because some some features are, are they are their reality so you can't you can't say um i you know let's 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 say skin color you know i can't i can't believe i i guess i i guess he would say well you you can believe that that's not what's impacting your discrimination you can believe you can believe that you you can't believe that you're not a certain skin color but you can change your belief around how your skin color impacts your life so there's it's a little bit more complicated than just uh you know changing a belief and then and then your behavior will change and your feelings about it will change and I would disagree with him on the feelings part that it is it is a feeling because we human beings are we are feeling organisms. And a lot of what we call feeling is uh, it's invisible. It's psychological, it's emotional. It's in the, you know, it's physical in the sense that it's a, it's a it's a product of neurons firing in the limbic system in the brain. That's where our feelings are seated. Um, so it's physiological and it's physical to that extent, but you can't really see a feeling. I could sit here and be feeling a lot of stuff that nobody knows if I don't express it behaviorally or speak it verbally. So feelings are very, they're mysterious, funny little things. But, uh, and, and I'm coming at you as a therapist. People come in to see me because of how they feel. They don't come in to get insight. I have to convince people that insight is important. And I'm a big fan of insight. I love insight. I think insight is huge fun. But not everybody likes insight. <laughs> a lot of people don't want to be bothered with insight. And a lot of, I would say more, more of those people are men than women. So I'm going to go back to the old gender gap thing. But um, it's just, you know, insight, because insight can hurt. Insight is painful. And the most powerful instincts human beings have are, one, to avoid pain. That's the, we don't survive if we don't avoid pain. Pain is our indicator that something's going to hurt us and maybe annihilate us. So we have to avoid pain or the species dies out. And the other most powerful second, I would say second, is to belong, to attach to a group because also survival, that is where our survival lies. We are safer in numbers. And that's, that's all creation, right? Not just humanity. So if we sense that we don't belong, if we sense there's something wrong with us, or we've been, if you have the identity of being adopted, you sense that you were rejected, or you know, you have, you know, somebody told you the reality is, you were rejected by your mother, the person that our culture tells us is uh, the one individual on the planet in your whole life the course of your whole life, who was supposed to love you, keep you, want to protect you, and you were not. And I think that is, that's the traumatic belief in a lot of adoptees, right? It's not necessarily uh, something that, and, and this is probably um, congruent with what your, Gabor, was that who, who you quoted? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you believe that you were rejected because there's something wrong with you or you're, you're not lovable or whatever, if that's your belief, that is going to hurt. And you're going to act on that belief. You're going to do things with that belief yeah. that probably make you less likely to be acceptable to other human beings.
so it was a very profound moment for me when the tears were streaming down my face reading the letter from my birth mother and realizing that she loved me so that was a very emotionally loaded insight yeah what what were the were the what was the tears what were the what did it hurt were you hurt by it, it, it i i was I was hurt by her hurt. Mm. Her hurt hurt me. Her pain hurt me. Her powerlessness hurt me. Her uh, desperation hurt me. I, I got her. I got her at, at, I felt connected with her. And I realized I had an insight about how wrong I'd been, but it was all wrapped up. It wasn't, it, it, it wasn't, um, uh, you know, a, it, it was a, a logic bedded in emotion. It was, it was embedded in, in the emotion. There was, the, there was a huge emotional shift. I was breaking down to, I was breaking down to 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 break through looking back on it. It's about eight, ten years ago now. So it, it wasn't it wasn't like it wasn't like an insight. Oh, I realized that there's a shortcut <laughs> to get to the swimming pool. Why have I been going this why have I been going this silly way? It, it it wasn't like that. It was profound. It was it was a profound shift and it was a, a shift and it was a realization that I had two little spells of time, 20 seconds or so, where I was afraid of her, when I believed that she'd um, uh, rejected me. And, and I think what makes it easy, easier for me is, is that, that those past periods had been so short-lived. So it was like my belief wasn't, my belief was just concrete, not concrete with reinforced with steel. Yeah. It didn't have K bar, do you call it? And it, you, you've got um, the, the, the belief wasn't as, um, as uh, it wasn't a constant theme in my life. The feeling wasn't a constant theme in, in my life. It was shorter sure to live um well i don't know about that who who knows yeah <laughs> who knows I, but i, I want to bring it back away from me um i want to i want to bring it back a, a, away from me because i know that it, i just did a recording just be, before we hopped on right uh with uh, uh an adoptee um stephanie flores coolish I hope I've remembered that right. Got the the, the name right, the, the right one. Coolish Forest Boy. And and she she talked about her one of her most profound moments happening when in her mid twenties, when she realised in a therapist chair that actually the 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 problem lay in the mothers, not in her. She, she'd um, taken the problem, made the problem internal uh, when it wasn't, it wasn't in her. Uh, and that opened everything up because the therapist said, well, you've been, in, you've been emotionally, she said, emo emotionally abused or something was the word that, that, that she said. And she was talking, mainly she was talking about her um, adoptive mothers, um, how much emotional trash, how much emotional baggage the, her, her adoptive mum had had so that she couldn't, she didn't have the emotional intelligence, she didn't have the, she couldn't, she couldn't attune to a daughter. Those are the sorts of things that I came off the back of it. So it, 
it's in those profound moments. That's why I try to ask people about the profound moments when the shifts have happened in the hopes that the shifts that we discuss on this podcast catalyze shifts within the listeners. That's that's what I'm that's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to do. And and this this big shift, like how we see ourselves, how we see our core, how we see our identity, how we see our essence as adoptees seems to me to be the difference that makes the difference. Because yeah. centri what was the word you use? Centrifugal? Centrifugal. Centrifugal. Yeah. So it's all about the um the the self image, the self identity. Um so the question is what 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 shifts that? What what have you seen uh that shifts that bearing in mind because that's gonna knock onto the thoughts, feelings and behaviors. So s- some of some of what you're talking about, I I believe, and I can be wrong, but I believe that insight and, and to some extent emotion too um, is bound up in development. So, for instance, uh, your revelation, your experience reading your mom's letter. If somebody had given you that letter when you were 16, how I don't know how old you were when you saw the letter. Uh, 48-ish. Okay, okay. 46-ish, yes. Do you think 16-year-old Simon would have had the same, may, been able to make the same empathic leap over to her mother, your mother's pain and your mother's experience? I don't know. Yeah. I, unlikely, I, can tell you. I would guess. I, I'd have yeah. to guess. <laughs> I don't like... Highly unlikely. Um, yeah. I, had a, I, I had a kid who... At, in her teens, um, had been she had been adopted, raised by a, a little kooky, a little crazy, but loving, doting parents, uh, adoptive parents, and she was spoiled rotten. You know, at sixteen, got a brand new Volvo, that kind of was spoiled rotten. But um, so, but she, she, you know, she had some torment, and uh, I asked her if she ever thought about trying to find her birth mom. And she said, it, it just furiously said, F her, you know, I, I know I shouldn't say the F word on here, but F her. And I was like, whoa, wow. <laughs> okay. Because, you know, I could feel the rage, you know, she was really angry. Now, nah, I never want to know her. I never want to see her and nothing about her. That woman is now almost 40 years old. And I uh, spoke with her a little while ago. Guess what? She found her mom. She went and found her mom. But when she was a teenager, who she was, and part of it is identity, because your identity is not even beginning to form yet. You know, I mean, you're you're working on your identity in your teen years. You're trying to have one and you need one, but you don't really get one if you're lucky, if you get one. As you develop, as you develop, and when you're an adult, when you're a full blown adult, then you have some identity. When she got her identity, when she knew who she was, then she felt she was able to confront this other individual and find out all about her. But she could not do that. And this was a this was a woman who would have told you that she was not hurt by her adoption. So she was, quote unquote, in the fog, right? Drank the Kool-Aid, all the all the analogies. Um, but but ultimately she did. She, and she she did say to me, it was out of curiosity. But I don't know. <laughs> Is that curiosity? <laughs> I don't know. Um, not for me to say. If she wants to believe that, that's fine. Um, but I, I I like what you said about um, knowing that it's super important. It's super important for an adoptee 
to come to the realization that this thing that happened to them when they were an infant or even a small child, that they had no power to do anything about, it's not their responsibility. It had nothing to do with them. People, big people, were making stuff happen. And to come to some conclusion, to come to a conclusion about yourself, who you are, to believe that that's who you are. Uh, the, I think the insight that you're talking about is the realization that, oh, geez, that's not, that's not about me at all. It has nothing to do with me. Uh, I, was, I was just there. I just happened to be there. I happened to be vulnerable and happened to be dependent because all children are. And but but you and you have probably seen and encountered some uh, adoptees who have taken on the identity of that child in perpetuity. They will always be the dependent child in every relationship they have. They become you know in in psychological terms, it's called the dependent personality disorder. They never grow. They never mature. They never become an adult. No amount of insight works with them because their core identity is dependency. Do do you, have you met adoptees like this? Um, I don't know whether I've met them, but I've I've seen them. Shall we say? Yeah. Okay. So here here we have somebody who takes that latches onto that idea, that notion, that belief. I was. I was, you know, faultless, blameless, wasn't me, I'm not unlovable, I'm not, you know, I got rejected by people who did something to me. It's not because of who I was. Ah, and the relief of that realization becomes a new religion for them. And they become utterly dependent. And they don't, you know, and I mean, that's... <laughs> So you use the word lovable, and um, I think uh, I've read it, listened to a couple of audio books by a, a guy on that subject. Um, and for me, if for, for me the 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 learnings on on seeing our own lovability. Right, and and gain clarity on identity. But what what's helped me the most is actually going outside the adoptee author community to see that. Right, I, I, I've loads the uh, the expert sharers of the lovability message um are i maybe i've just not found them in the adoptee community maybe they're there i, I no examples coming to my mind in in terms of lovability that's so a big enough name but if we look at vulnerability um yeah maybe lovability with brene brown she's she's a big she's a big deal um on humility, vulnerability, recovering perfectionism, re recovering perfectionist. Th these gifted people uh, give us a, a way to see things. That they they describe things to us in a way that makes them different and and prompts insights. Within us, right? Going outside, um, because whether you are an adoptee or not, I know I know an awful lot of people that are not that that aren't adopted that don't see themselves as loved. Yeah, yeah. No, the 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 issues of uh, I mean, just basic being alive and trying to trying to do this thing called life 
they're not all that different for adoptees, you know, but, but if your whole identity is wrapped around that one experience you had, true, it was, it was an experience that affected everything else profoundly. And it was an experience that happened early and was frustrating or traumatizing, if you want to use that word. Yeah. But one thing, and I'm going to say this, and it's going to, you're going to get a lot of bad messages about this. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry in advance, Simon. A lot of, I won't say a lot, a few adoptees I have known and met have a blindness about um, universal human experience. They're, they think, or they, their belief is that everything bad ha has come to them because of adoption, because of their adoption. And that some of the stuff that, like this, the adopter you were talking about, who had insights about her adoptive mother. Well, everybody's got a mother that's a little fucked up, you know? Because uh, cause I'm just going to say, as a mother, I screwed up with my kids. I made mistakes. I did stuff that hurt them. I did stuff that wasn't great for them. Um, sorry, kids. But uh, it, it, if, you, if your whole frame is, no, 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 that's just because I was adopted, they, they, you know, that becomes their their identity and they're rabid about it and they fail to extend any kind of sympathy or courtesy or, or understanding to somebody who wasn't. And they get very tribal. Yeah. Am I going to piss people off with that? I, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so be it. So be it. Um, I just want to share a bit about because mainly it's adoptees on the show listeners at the moment, right? So Corey's done an awful lot, which is too modest to talk about to for, for our for our cause. I haven't asked her about it. She's done an awful lot for our cause. And um so she noticed that there was this massive gap in her own education um as a therapist. Uh, and as a as an educator, and she brought lived experience adoptees, birth mothers into uh, into the UCLA. It was UCLA, wasn't it? No, it was uh, Cal State Northridge. Sorry, Cal State Northridge. So she she brought in these lived experience uh, people with lived experience of of adoption to uh, hopefully well to 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 broaden them narrative to ensure that a uh, a gap in their curriculum that was missing was uh, uh, was addressed to some point to some extent um, but she's also ri written a, a great book called orphan which is a redemption tale um and it's on audio as well so it makes it easier for 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 busy people to listen when they're walking the dogs and stuff um and you describe this as your gift to, to us, adoptees. Um, and you use the word subliminal right at the top of our, 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 uh, our conversation because it, it, it's, it's this edutainment stuff. So, so Corey is in, um, in California and edutainment is, did, did somebody from Disney Co uh, co coin that term right so it's education mm -hmm. and entertainment it's a mashup between education and entertainment right so they call it edutainment right you mm -hmm. uh get you you uh you give people what they want a great story and you embed some subliminal learnings along the way uh and you you give us a gift um you you give us a gift now what what is it that you were? I know what I got out of it. Um, oh, I would love to hear that. So I, I got I 
I just got the redemption and the the hope thing this so it, the, the 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 hope stuff uh and the despite whatever no matter what no matter what um there's hope you know um there's there's hope of growth there's hope of change there's hope of uh, a a shift in our feelings uh, a, a lessening of our tough emotions um a uh, and then also the it's not i think it's our response to our emotions that's the that's the cha more challenging thing it's so for me it's worrying about worry or being angry about anger you know it's trying to squash the feelings it's trying to suppress the feelings it's trying to stuff the feelings it's trying to avoid the feelings it's all that stuff uh, which is um a losing battle it we never we, we never win that we never what, what we resist persists um so that's kind of what I got out of it. Um, hope. What what was the gift that you were hoping to give, or were you hoping that it, everybody was going to get a different thing out of it? <laughs> um, I that was a long time ago. <laughs> that was a long time ago when I wrote the book, and um, it's still valid today oh. just, i read i listened to it last month right it, it's oh god <laughs> like people i was talking to an adoption pro, um agency person uh like adoption has changed but human emotions haven't right you know yeah. like, it doesn't yeah that's true i i, I will say that the uh, elevator pitch would be uh that a um a child who has experienced the worst that life can throw at you um, can still flourish and grow and thrive and find find hope and succeed and they are not hopelessly uh, consigned to a traumatic event and e even though they keep coming right these traumatic that's part of being alive that you know in the book the professor st starts one of his lectures talking about the vicissitudes of life well oh my god that's so overwritten <laughs> and so overwrought <laughs> um but it's true it's true we Every day we wake up, something good could happen, something great could happen, something bad could happen, some horrible thing could happen. I, last night I went to bed and I, I couldn't stop thinking that an earthquake was going to happen. I started obsessing about an earthquake. I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, did you feel that? <laughs> there was no earthquake. But any day living in California, we could have a massive earthquake. And yet we all carry on, you know, we all just, oh, today I'm going to do this. But what would happen? I, I've lived through the 94 earthquake. It, when that happens, whoop, everything stops. Look at 2020. Everything stopped. The world stopped. The world came to a stop. And, and yet here we are. All of us are back to doing what we do, you know, as if it didn't happen. And I think that's part of the message of the book is that's what we do. We pick up. We carry on. We go on. It's just part of our adventure living life as a human being is adventurous. Yeah. I want to go back to what you're saying about, um, is this human or is, is this a human thing or is this an adoptee thing? Right. So I interviewed a mentor of mine a couple of years ago on the show. And, and one of the, one of the things that I got on that point, right? So X has happened. Is is X 
due to adoption or is X due to being a human, right? And something that I got from her was, I'll never know. I'll never know. And trying to figure it out, whether this is a human thing or an adoption thing, is essentially a futile um, a, a, a futile question because I will never know. I, I will never know because I I am me. I'm a, an adopted human. So it, it's all it's uh, it, all my experiences are all wrapped up in 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 my life, and it's impossible to identify which is what. So uh, and then, but we'll never know. But well. Uh, what what if I'm okay with that? What if I'm okay with not knowing? Okay, so what if I'm so it's like an acceptance of ambiguity. Okay, so yeah, amb ambiguity. And then I think, well, what what does it mean if if this is a human thing that I've been through? If this is a human thing rather than an adoptee thing. Does that give me more choices? And I feel it. I feel it does. I do too. Because, I because agree. It, it means that I can, for example, read, read books, uh, watch videos, listen to audios, listen to podcasts from the best explainers in the business, the best insight catalysts in the business, the best pointers in the business, the best educators, the best, the, the most gifted communicators in the business. Because if I if I if I'm looking for a, a shift, if if I'm conscious, if I'm looking for a shift, I want to have the best people on my team. Um uh, and that makes it that that gives me a better choice, a better a better chance of growth and change going forward. Can I can I add something to that? Um, of course. I think it was Aldous Huxley in uh, Brave New World, I think, who said um, that. One of the one of the um, reasons why this is going back to the fifties and sixties, what the prohibition against divorce, and we're starting to see this here in the states. I, I don't know if you're watching what's going on in our politics, but this um, Project Twenty Twenty Five is all over the news. There's a certain faction, a certain group of people, right wing people, who want to take us back to the fifties and sixties reduce women's rights and make it impossible for women to get no fault divorce and so forth. And this, this writer, I think it was Huxley said that one of the reasons why children are traumatized by divorce, it, it's not because divorce hurts them. You know, plenty of, you know, plenty of people were getting divorced. What is it's society's uh, attitude toward family, broken families, our language about it was was all wrong. And I think this this is true in adoption too. That and that's and it's shifting a lot of the because of open adoptions and because um people are with DNA testing, people are finding their birth parents much earlier. Um the secrecy is gone, the you know the and, and to some extent the taboo is gone, the taboo about talking about it. It's all shifting in the adoption world. So if we start looking at adoption differently, if society as a whole stops seeing it as a trauma, and it's just like in, in some communal societies, if a mother dies or a mother you know, is insane or can't take care of her child, the community gathers around and they take care of the child and the child grows up you know, perceivably with no trauma because the society doesn't doesn't uh, pathologize the child because his mother happened to be ill or you know passed away, and 
maybe that's what in some um, in some way we should be working toward that in a societal manner to change how society views adoption. It's not a bunch of poor, unlovable or undesired kids who, you know, some really decent, generous person is going to come in, the savior model, right? Is going to come in and rescue this child. And I, I keep hearing adoptees. I have heard a, a lot of adoptees get furious when they're called lucky. <laughs> oh, you yeah. were so lucky that they adopted you. And I had an experience myself with that at a wedding shower when a young man was there for the very first time with his extended family, his extended um, birth family. And he's watching this, this baby shower go on. And, and I said to him, are, what are you thinking? Are you, are you just thinking about all the years that you lost, all, uh, everything you missed? Because this is a big, happy, boisterous family, right? Irish. And he said, no, I'm thinking about everything they lost. Oops. <laughs> and he was right. You know, what a dumb thing for me to say, right? So, uh, I don't know. And what if we're okay about that? What if we're yeah. okay not knowing? So, um, the book's called Orphan, uh, listeners, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And I, it's uh, it's ho hopefully going to be made into a film. Yes. Yeah, it's probably next year now. It's looking like next year. Brilliant. So when it comes out, you'll have to come back on the show. I will. I will definitely do that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else that I've not asked you about that you'd like to share, Corey? Uh, no, you've been very thorough. And I thank you so much for this conversation. I, for, I forget that you're taping. I'm wiggling around. <laughs> so It'll be what it'll be. Okay. Yeah. And you are so lovely and lovely you to too. put up with uh, my technology difficulties and, and my flights of fancy. Thank you so much. You're an indulgent man. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. Thank you, listeners. And we'll speak to you again very soon. Take care. Bye. Okay. <laughs>